Welcome everyone to uh, Strathcona, uh, Vancouver's old East End. It's very ironic actually that we're standing here on the very first street that ever had its name changed in Vancouver history. And uh, two years after this, the founding of Vancouver, DuPont Street, east of Maine, was renamed Princess Street because of the prejudices associated with Chinatown and also the red light district going on in what is now the core of Chinatown. So it's, it's neat to see that history being recognized and honored here today. Um, wow, it's, it's a real thrill to be here. As Jessica mentioned, I uh, nominated uh, this uh, house to be included in this program. The, there's a little bit of a background story on this. Uh, some years back I was uh, doing a uh, fundraiser walking tour for the Vancouver Heritage Society and I had never done a walking tour before and I knew I, where I wanted to start my tour but I was trying to find a place to finish and if you look two doors down on your left there's a very beautiful house with some really neat architectural uh, details on it. And late at night, the day before uh, my walking tour, I was doing some last minute studying on that house because I thought it would be nice to sort of end up the tour, the East End tour, with a bit of an architectural bang. When my eyes strayed to information about this house two doors down, I was looking at the 1911 uh, census of Canada. And the names that jumped out at me were two other very his, uh, important names associated with this house's history, and that was Nora and Ross Hendricks, who were Jimi Hendrix's grandparents. So you're looking at not only the Nellie Ip Kwong house, this is actually probably the very first house that Jimi Hendrix's grandparents lived in when they moved to Canada in 1911. That's the year they were moving here. 1911 was the year of the census. They don't show up in the directories, but they do show up in the census and it was just a fluke me trying to figure out um, how to end my tour that I found out the Hendrix connection and I came and I, I um, uh, talked to Vincent Wayne about this discovery because I was so excited that I found something historically important about their house but then they said to me well that's that's really great but there's also this whole story about Nellie Ip Kwong and and I thought wow this is amazing it's just another example of uh, the rich deep history that the East End has, that every one of these houses here in, in Vancouver's oldest neighborhood has stories to tell, and it's really exciting to know that after me, other people who are related to Nellie Kwong and her family will talk more about uh, um, that story. But anyway, just some basic information on the house. I'm a house history researcher. Um, this house was built in 1908 by uh, an English-born carpenter named Fred Webster who came to Canada in uh, 1906. And uh, he never lived in the house. He built a number of houses here in the East End. The very first person to live in the house was a man named Frederick Percy. And he was a lumberman and contractor. He and his wife Annie and their two sons lived in the house for a year. Uh, again, it's just a very small slice of the house's history. Of course, today we're honoring the connection between Nellie Ip Kwong, a, nat a national historic person, uh, someone that uh, needs to be recognized, and I'm just so thrilled to see that today we're actually going to have recognition posted in front of the house. Welcome to the East End. Thanks for coming. Great. Thank you, James. And now I'd like to call on Eleanor Lum, and uh, we have a starlet here as well. So this is Nellie Yip's daughter and granddaughter. Um, my family and I would like to thank you for honoring our granny by being here this afternoon. Everyone in Chinatown who knew Mrs. Yip Kwong also knew her fondly as granny. She insisted on it. She was just that kind of person. I'm sure she would never have imagined in her wildest dreams we would all be standing here on the porch in her front yard garden celebrating her life with a plaque. Two, in fact one in English and the other in Chinese. How appropriate. When not delivering babies, Granny lived a very frugal, ordinary, everyday life of a Chinese woman in the 1900s. Hard work with no thought of instant reward, the immense importance of family and friends, tea and mahjong. Her world was pretty much with an eight block radius of her home here on Bender Street. Although she did venture out to the farms of Steveston, 
We know that as she was the midwife that birthed our dad, Frank Lum, and his brothers and sisters into the world. I always liked that story as it helps to make sense of my life and how connected we all are. How small and familiar Chinatown was in the early days and how a good community raised great people. Granny was a down-to-earth, good-hearted woman, a simple girl from the Maritimes who just decided she wanted to live a remarkable life. It could not have been an easy life for her at the beginning, striving to become part of a culture she knew nothing about. I often think how brave and determined that 18-year-old girl must have been. I hope that she inspires in each of us the possibility that our lives at the end of the day would be worthy of a plaque in the garden. Thank you. Well, thanks everybody for coming. And Starlet has pretty well said everything that I want to say. But as you can understand, this is a very emotional time for us. So thanks for coming in. As a historian, as a UBC historian, like it's, you know, I don't want to keep us out here any longer than necessary. But I, I think one of the things about the story of Nellie is that, you know, this place here, Strathcona, has been a place of mixture and people you know, crossing lines and crossing boundaries. And, and if there is one story more than almost any other that, that it really embodies that, it's, it's her story. And it's actually the story of Vancouver in general now. And so Strathcona really was, you know, all that was ideal and great, you could say, about what Vancouver was and would become. And there's other less happy, darker episodes in our history, but, but maybe in honoring Nellie Yip, we actually honor also that which is best about the city. And so uh, thank you, and we'll pass it back to Jessica. Anyway, Nellis received a private education in the United States, and she became a school teacher in Boston. And while she was in New York, she met this young Chinese man, Charlie Yip, who was the nephew of Yip Sang the well-to-do merchant in Chinatown. They got married in 1900, and unfortunately, her church, the Catholic Church, disavowed her, and so um, they didn't believe in racial marriages, and so uh, both uh, Nellie and Charles went back to Vancouver, and they lived at 51 Pender Street, the uh, famous house of the uh, Yip Sang. Now, you probably wonder, how did Nellis uh, became a, um, uh, uh, um, yes, <laughs> well, what, uh, what it was, uh, she became a very good friend of Sister Frances Redmount, who was trained as a nurse and midwife at Laval University. So Sister Frances and father built St. Luke's Hospital in 1888, which was connected to the St. James Anglican Church. So she also opened the first training school for nurses in Vancouver. And Francis Street in East Vancouver is named after her. So it was from Sister Francis that Nellis learned midwifery. And she also gained the trust of Chinatown so that in total she was a midwife to 500 Chinese women. So you're probably asking yourself, how does a woman from a maritime learn to speak Chinese? Well, it happened when she was living at the Yip Sang building at 51 Pender Street. Mr. Yip Sang himself hired a tutor for his 23 children. And she sat in on that class to learn Chinese. And so that's how she got to learn the different dialects and got along very well with the residents in Chinatown. And she was really quite a figure because she really believed in certain rights. Uh, just the fact that she did marry a Chinese, and here she was in Chinatown. And she was a leading advocate for women's rights and having more voice in the community as such. So that was one of the legacy of Nellis. Uh, I like people to remember her because she fought very hard back then in the 1930s. And uh, I think she was a very brave and honorable woman at that time. So thank you. Yeah, I got interested in the history of, uh, quite a few years back because, you know, it was just, you just need to know a lot more about who you are and where you come from. But, you know, historians is such a lofty term. I'd rather look at myself as a keeper of memories. And that's what I feel I am. Um, 
I just want to start by saying that I'm an outsider. I was born in Chi I was not born in Chinatown like many of the others here. I came to Canada, in fact, in 1953. I was three years old, and I was part of the first wave of Chinese immigrants allowed into Canada after the Chinese Exclusion Act repealing in 1947. My personal journey into Chinatown came through the many stories I heard from many of these Chinese elders. Yet among all these stories of isolation, discrimination, suffering, there emerged champions, people who would stand head and shoulder above others, that were willing to sacrifice their time and, 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 and energy and place themselves even in harm's way to protect and defend what they believe is right and what is theirs. These heroic figures in our community's history who did remarkable things are like people like Fun, Wang Fun Sing, Douglas Jung, Laurie Andy Cho, and many others in later times have fallen in their footsteps, but they were mostly men. There are remarkably few women, but there is one, Nelly Yip Gong. She began life like many of us, rather unremarkable. Yet life is all about choices and moments of clarity. And once she chose her, uh, to follow her heart and to love and marry Huan Yip, a Chinese man, at a time when it was the worst possible social taboo, her life path was set. And yet, I'm not sure from, for her from the onset that that one important willful decision that she made, that she probably never thought about and realized the enormous difficulties that lay before her. This is so, this, this owing of uh, an ostracization from her own personal family and forced to embrace not only her husband's family, who probably were less enthusiastic about embracing her, but ultimately the entire Chinese community. As I study these historical figures during their, uh, and during their lives, there are certain moments of clarity. And for Nellie, there was probably a moment when she came to realize that she had a greater purpose. And with that notion, she plunged herself into learning the language, learning about the suffering of those less able to defend themselves, people, the people, the women, and especially the wanted children of Chinatown. She saw and she embraced the Chinese community, and it became her family. Unlike others, she became the instrument of the community. She made herself useful, and the more she embraced the community as her family, the more fiercely passionate and protective she was of it. Unlike all champions, she was fearless and not afraid to speak out, she used her unique ability to speak multiple languages to bridge two cultures and make her community's voice heard when it needs so badly to be heard. All of those who devote their lives to the community, she also is a very complicated person. And I can imagine that she was very much alone, where very few people to turn to that would comfort and understand and appreciate what she had become. And when I found out about her, her remarkable deeds and her legacy. I cannot help but be filled with admiration for such, and love for such an individual. And I'm glad to be given the privilege to speak and bear witness to her life and to have the rare privilege to publicly say thank you to Nelly, to wholeheartedly embrace and commemorate her life, her spirit, and her love for all those things she stood for. And finally, if there is ever a need for a patron saint of this Chinatown, it would be Nelly Yip Gong. So my name is Bela Lazarus, and I'm a member of the board of directors of the Vancouver Heritage Foundation that puts together this Places That Matter pl project. And this is one of the more enjoyable parts of my role. The uh, Vancouver Heritage Foundation started the project in 2011 as part of the 125th anniversary of the incorporation of the city. And what's great about it is that it was people in the communities that nominated and voted on these locations. And it was just an independent body that finalized the final 125 locations. So the Vancouver Heritage Foundation is a not-for-profit organization that helps um, keep those memories in the city. Somebody called themselves a keeper of memories. And these places, people, and events are the keepers of the memories in the city. And Vancouver Heritage Foundation uh, serves to support the um, keeping these places around because they help to reuse uh, debris out of the landfill, they speak to our history, and they do give, give our city a sense of place. Uh, we'll be posting photos of the event on the Facebook page, which is VHF's Places That Matter.
and live tweeting today. So join us in spreading the word if you've got your phone, the hashtag places that matter. Please visit our website, VancouverHeritageFoundation.org. For more information... Uh, my name is Eleanor Yip, alum now, and we're all here uh, commemorating my mom's plaque uh, with his host that's a whole hundred years old, which uh, and she brought a lot of babies into this world right here. And so it's a lot of nice, uh, nice crowd that's come out here today. And I'm very happy. That's all turned out well.